Okay. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, it might be different time where you are, but um, so this is Margaret speaking, and I'm super happy to welcome you to one of the breakout sessions for day two of the symposium on disability cultural centers in higher education. I'm really happy that you found the different room. So good job, um, immediate win as we start. So Tony and I are here and we're gonna introduce ourselves more in a little bit, but we're gonna kind of be presenting back and forth um, about designing a DCC. And um, for that part, just to reduce distraction, we're gonna keep the chat closed, but then we'll open it up and we're anticipating having a good amount of time for a group discussion and questions and you know brainstorming together. Um, but just a heads up that the chat is closed to everyone, but you can always message us at any time, and we hope you will, especially if you're having um, some kind of access issue that we should troubleshoot. Okay, and then you should have gotten a notification, but just in case, we're recording the session to share out later, especially since we have sessions going at the same time for those of us who don't want to choose. Um, but if that changes how you want to be present, like your, your display name or your camera on or off, just so you know, it is being recorded. Um, okay, are there any adjustments before we continue? Okie dokie. So here is the plan. Um, as I mentioned, we are gonna each introduce ourselves the first time we share and we're really here to share our thoughts and experiences around some of the nuts and bolts of setting up and kind of nurturing a disability cultural center especially in the early stages um, and then like i said we'll have some time for q a um, so i'm going to drop some access copies in the chat i'm not going to be talking about it all at once but in case you would like to refer to the electronic copy you can do that, okay. Um, cool, so my name is Margaret Fink. Um, I'm the director of UIC at the University of Illinois Chicago, um, their Disability Cultural Center. Um, and a little more about me, I'm uh, somebody that uses she, her pronoun, and I identify as disabled. Um, it's actually a little bit apparent because I have my hair up, but. Um, I'm deaf. I wear a cochlear implant on one side. FYI, that's more intel because it's a visual description element. Um, and I also have started identifying as neurodivergent. So I'm feeling very in touch with students or faculty staff that are like, I'm pretty sure this describes me, but I'm feeling hesitant about, you know, claiming the full belonging, thinking about it. Um, and uh, to continue my visual description, I'm a white woman with clear glasses and I have dark brown hair, which I have pulled up into a bun at the moment. And I'm wearing a white t-shirt that is also a t-shirt that says act, or ableism is trash, but you can't really see that, but I'm letting you know. Um, and I'm sitting in my office, which is an old classroom. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit. And so the, the walls are cinder block and there's like a little bookshelf behind me with a lamp. Um, and there's also a chalkboard where I was drawing a diagram of how would we do a hybrid event. Um, and I haven't fully tried that yet, but okay. So Tony, I hope it's okay with you. I'm gonna just talk a little bit about the space stuff that we figured out and then toss it back. Um, Okay, so let me just share my screen really quickly. Okay, so this is Margaret speaking. I hope that what you're looking at is a slideshow that says designing a DCC. Thank you for the thumbs up. Um, okay, I'm gonna go into slideshow mode, but then it, 
Okay, so this is just the title slide that says Designing in DCC. It has my name, Margaret Fink, um, and our UIC Disability Cultural Center logo with a piece of the symposium logo that shows the two leaves in a circle for a bud. Um, and this slide is a title slide that says Space Together. Um, okay, so this slide has a picture of the DCC lounge. Um, and I wanna, I'm gonna describe it a little bit at length just so you kind of know what our space is like, um, but a little bit of just context information that it might be helpful to know about me is that I was hired in August, 2019. And I was the first, um, well, I don't really know how to talk about this, but there were two interim directors before I took over. Um, and so I was the first, I suppose, uh, permanent director, I guess that's how you would talk about it. Um, and I was working very closely with a lot of lovely staff who had been at the DCC since it had been founded. So with these two interim directors. Um, and so I'm saying all of that just to sort of cue that I was not coming into a situation where people had not been thinking about the space yet at all. That's not true. There was a lot of really amazing work that had already happened. Um, so the other thing I would like to just share as some context information about our space is that um, our Disability Cultural Center had a temporary room in the library when it was first founded. Um, and then before I arrived, one of the interim directors handled the move to our permanent space, um, which is in a classroom building called the Behavioral Sciences Building. And the, the rooms that we have are three classrooms. One is larger and it serves as our lounge. And there are two smaller classrooms. One is for a staff office. So we have like our printer, a copying machine in there. We have storage for art supplies and a few desks for um, staff members of the DCC and grad workers and undergrads when they're working here. And then there's another small classroom, the one I'm sitting in right now, which is the director's office. So that's my office. And in terms of an office for one person, it's a little big. So we also store extra furniture in here, which I'm happy to show you if you're really curious, but there's like a bunch of furniture piled up to my left. Um, so I, I wanted to also just share with you some of the elements of our space and some of the things that we've heard people really appreciate about this space and some things that were like thoughtful choices that were made before I arrived. Um, so first of all, in this image, there is a lounge. This is a shot of our lounge. And there's like, um, there's carpeting. It's that kind of really not very thick carpeting that is present in institutional buildings a lot. And it's got white cinder block walls, no windows, which is kind of a bummer. Um, but some of the choices that were made before I came are to have a variety of kinds of seating. So there's a small like pleather sofette that would seat a couple people, one person with extra room. Um, and then there's a beanbag chair, which is a favorite in, in our community. Like people really seek out the beanbag chair because it's one of the only one of the few truly comfortable seats on campus for people who might have pain or just need something really soft to be comfortable. Um, and then we have some tables. There's one communal table in this photo that has a tablecloth on it. Um, and then that's kind of like for people who want to either eat or study on some kind of a surface. We also have adjustable height desks in the space. They're not in this photo, but um, that's another nice feature that people were thinking through as they set up the space before I arrived. Um, and another note, it's a pretty small detail of this photo, but there's an open seat at the table. So we do have chairs around the table, but we are 
pretty intentional about leaving at least one space at a desk or one space at the table um, open without a chair there for people who are already bringing their own chair, their wheelchair users to make it easy to roll up. Um, okay, and then just some other elements of this space. We have a library, which is not in this photo with a bunch of books. Um, it's a wonderful collection, a lot of different kinds of books from poetry to zines that are kind of like resource guides for disabled people, by disabled people to disability studies books. Um, so that's something that people are invited to check out when they're in this space. And uh, we also have a little kitchenette. It's sort of like a shelf or like a countertop with a microwave and um, a tea kettle, a coffee pot, and a little refrigerator. And people can sort of make themselves some tea, reduce stock tea in our, in our center, and coffee, even though people don't typically make it that often yet. Um, OK, and then the other thing that we have in this space that I wanted to highlight before shifting gears to some of the tweaks we made is we do have like a bunch of foam rollers and various kinds of cushions for a seat to make it more comfortable and people are welcome to sort of customize their spot. Um, we also have some of those um, stands where it usually sits on a desktop and it's kind of the size of a piece of paper. You can put a book on it or a piece of paper so that you can read or study without changing the position of your neck if that's not comfortable. Um, and then last but not least, my predecessor, the interim director before I arrived, Dean Adam, um, got automatic doors installed to all of our rooms, which was, I, as I understand, not super easy and it was extremely impactful. And the, the other thing that I just want to name, in case you're trying to think through this for your own space, these are automatic door buttons that are not tiny. Like sometimes automatic door buttons are the size of a credit card or something pretty small. These are those ones that extend from the floor up to um, like 36 inches. Okay, so Tony, do you want to describe your space or should I go ahead and talk about the tweaks that we did. You can go ahead. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, oh, thank you. Somebody in the chat let me know that you can see my desktop, which is full of stuff. Um, thank you for letting me know. I think I don't mind if you don't. If anybody finds it distracting, please let me know. Um, okay, cool. So. This is another image of our lounge, and it is an image that um, shows the little library that we have built. So this is kind of, again, the same room. It's a room that has cinder block walls. Um, there's an adjustable height desk in this image, and sort of like a pleather so fet that, you know, is wider than a typical chair. Uh, there's our beanbag chair in this shot. And um, the library is in a bookshelf that is also kind of like a media stand. So there's a large TV in this, um, this sort of collection of bookshelves, um, which I'll talk about in a moment. And then one thing that I didn't really mention before is we do have lamps throughout the space. So one thing that we talked about a lot when I started was wanting people to be able to customize the space to their needs. So I've mentioned that we have pillows, we have um, like stand for using document. Um, so we wanted people to be able to sort of set up an area that would work for them. But we were also thinking through people whose access needs um, mean that they need the space to be predictable. So if the space were changing around a lot every day or every time they came in, that would be an issue. So um, this may seem super basic, but it was helpful for us to realize that we need to have a reset mode. So there's a certain place where things were located every all the time, unless people wanted to adjust it. 
And then it would be the job of whoever was working in the lounge to make sure that the lounge got reset when that person left the space. So sometimes we would ask people to do it themselves. And if not, um, we would just have the person working put the um, items away or put the furniture back where it was. Um, another sort of tweak that we took up is something that I put on this slide as a fragrance detox. So um, one of our workers, Sylvie Rosenkalt, who I think is presenting in the other session right now, um, before I arrived, gathered every single cleaning supply, gathered all of our dry erase markers, dry erase marker cleaner, anything that kind of had pretty intense chemical smells to them or a pretty intense fragrance. And it was, to be honest with you, just hanging out in a drawer because we didn't want to throw it away exactly, but we didn't want to use it um, for a while. And we, we got, you know, uh, fragrance-free cleaning supplies, which pro tip is often located in the baby section of a like large store. We were trying to buy it at Target and I found it difficult to locate sometimes. Um, and we also kept fragrance-free hand soap on our front desk for anybody who needed that and wanted to take it into the bathroom with them. Um, that is something that we did attempt to take up with the university, um, just explaining to them that having these strong fragrances in the cleaning supplies could make some members of our community really sick. Um, and it, it's a really big job to ask the entire university to change their cleaning supplies. And um, there are rules I learned about uh, using certain kinds of products to clean um, anything that would be considered bodily waste. Um, so we did not make a lot of ground on the actual cleaning supplies um, in the building, but we did manage to get them to change all of the hand soap campus-wide to fragrance-free. So that feels pretty good and like a big win. Um, okay, I'm going to try to speed it up, but Another really practical access thing that we encountered as we were continuing to develop this space is when we would hold an event, we would often want to project either some slides or maybe a movie, a video clip, whatever it might be. And we had a projector with kind of a pull down screen for that purpose. But if we were also having captions, open captions, um, there would not be a clear place where we could have the captions going um, on a second screen. So that's kind of the function of this large TV that we bought. Before that, we were kind of trying to do some major disability hacks where we had a computer with the size of the captions as large as they would go, kind of hanging out on the side of the room. Um, and it was just less than ideal. So that's something that I would encourage everyone who's thinking about designing a space where you're gonna do programming to think through. So you might, if you can, like it might be good to think about having multiple screens for the purpose of open access and whatever your event entails. Okay, and then last but not least, um, lighting is a challenge in our lounge and uh, the, the default lighting is fluorescent. And, you know, as we know, that's not a great option for a lot of people in our community. So the situation that is pictured in these photos of our lounge is that we have these lamps that are kind of, you know, like a lamp that you would buy at, you know, Target or whatever it may be. You can tell they're the Target really close to you, I see, because that's where we're trying to get a lot of our stuff. Um, and they're, they're fine. We have to go around and turn them on one, one by one. They are a better option than the fluorescent light. But one thing that we were encountering is that even with multiple lamps, it was still pretty dim. It was like, to some people, it was a soft 
living room vibe and it was nice, but to other people, it was too dim um, for the vision that they were using to navigate. Um, so we started researching really like nicer lamps, more expensive lamps, and actually found out that the issue was more the lumen rating of the light bulb. Um, if you already know this, you know something that I did not know two years ago. Um, light bulbs have like the temperature rating and they also have lumen rating and that's about the brightness. So we actually just switched out the light bulbs to something brighter and that did make a pretty big difference. It was a brightness that was similar to the fluorescent light. Um, okay, so as promised, very nuts and bolts. That's sort of the stuff that we figured out so far. I would say like our wish list items going forward is figuring out a way to affix things to the wall so that they don't fall off. We have a lot of issues getting things to stick to the wall. Um, but more importantly, we are really craving another space with a door to serve as a quiet space and to serve as a space where People can have a private conversation with one of our staff members since it's a shared office otherwise. Um, okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing and I would love to hear what Tony thought through, figured out, arranged for with space. So hi everyone, so great to see you all, uh, some of you again. Um, as Margaret alluded to, I'm Dr. Tony Saya. I am currently an assistant professor at San Diego State University in the Department of Administration, Rehabilitation and Post-Secondary Education. But before uh, starting my journey to SDSU, I was the first um, program coordinator of the Disability Cultural Center at the University of Arizona. Um, a quick verbal description, I'm a white woman in my early 30s. I have black and pink clear framed glasses. So me and Margaret are in the clear framed uh, group. And uh, I have blonde hair, straight uh, shoulder length, and I have a lot of my roots coming in. Um, I'm in the process of trying to decide if I wanna grow them out or not. So that's where we're at. Um, I identify as a disabled woman. I'm a wheelchair user and I use she, her pronouns. Before I uh, go into the, the space at the University of Arizona, I think it's really important to own the fact that I am speaking from the very early stages of the DCC. Uh, um, there, is, there is new leadership. Uh, we have new leadership on the call right now. Um, uh, the senior coordinator, Natty, is on the call. And so I just wanna be clear that I'm speaking from my perspective of the very early stages um, and obviously spaces change and, and space is fluid and you got to meet the needs of your community. So I'm only sharing um, from my perspective. And, um, and so Natty, I invite you if there's at any point um, something that you would like to add, I hope you know um, that your experience is, is valued here and I would love to share the space with you. Um, so in a previous session, I talked about how um, for, for the UADCC, we, when we went out for the initial grant, we had a space in mind and the space was housed on the second level of our disability services office. And the reason that we wanted that space was because, um, it was very open and it was naturally accept more accessible than other spaces on campus. Um, a lot of the other cultural centers on our campus, and again, this is from a 2018 perspective, so I don't know if things have shifted, but things uh, were, were, while they had space, it was very tight. And again, um, with funding, we didn't want space to be the reason that we didn't get funding. And so um, we ha already had this space in mind. So uh, a couple of things. Um, one thing about the space is, uh, we wanted it to be as universally designed as possible, um, not only for the people that were coming into our space, but to model for other centers, other collaborators. Um, we thought, you know, of course, there's importance of, of you know, overt education, 
but we were also hoping that um, we could serve as a model. So things like easy, uh, easily movable furniture, um, options in terms of seating, um, space to sit, uh, different different types of textures of seating, um, different tables, um, things like that. Um, well, one thing I did when I was there and um, for my office, instead of having a door in my office, I actually had a curtain um, because I thought uh, for me personally, it was more accessible and it created a very open um, vibe. And uh, again, um, that that kind of worked for me as a chair user. I always found it tough to um, kind of turn and close my door and so the curtain and I had it made by a disabled person so that was another way to share their talent and um, you know their work um, and so the physical space was really important because the way we uh, felt about it is um, it's really hard to get to culture if you don't have baseline access and we don't want just baseline we want access that contributes to a welcoming environment um, and so a lot of different uh, design choices and similar to, to what Margaret already shared, right? I think one of the things that keeps coming back is options. So options within the space. And that goes from like pens to markers to paint to furniture, right? Like I think one of the things that we try to model is these options. Um, and it, again, it's a fluid space. So maybe over time you realize that some options aren't as usable. But I think having them there, especially when you're first starting out, uh, we didn't know what people wanted, right? We can make our best guess. But uh, when I got there, no one knew that there was a cultural center at all. Um, I will say that we had some traffic because people already were coming into the disability services office. So um, for a while, um, you know, we looked at making it, uh, you know, an extension of, of that because it used to be a study space. And so we still wanted to leave room for that, but we also didn't want the whole space to be like, you can't talk in the space, right? So um, we had, you know, different areas, um, but it was one whole room. Um, we didn't have separate rooms like in the way Margaret's describing. The other thing I think that was super important when I initially got there is because it was housed in the disability services, like the resource center, it was really important that what was on the walls and what was in the space really took the next step to culture. So all the things that were on the, the um, walls were either a piece of our history, so um, like the signing of the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, photographs by disabled people, um, paintings by disabled people, um, to really um, to send the message that we're more than just just you know people to be serviced. We have talents, we have artwork, we have all these things, and so. Um, you know, right now in 2022, that might seem easier because we have social media more so. And um, but in 2018, it was really um, there. Obviously, I knew d uh, disabled artists exist and I knew their work, but it was it was a push to try to get um, to try to find artwork that fit the space and that we were very intentional about. Um, Right. If there was no push, when I say push, I meant like push to find um, the stuff, not any pushback. Everybody was really on board with with this approach. Um, and even in my own office, I chose to have all artwork and uh, representation of of disabled work, uh, whether it was artwork, photographs, painting. We even initially we had a call to disabled students to share their artwork so we could um, artwork or any any form of art that they wanted to be displayed um, in the space. And that was a really great way to bridge the, the community. Um, but I think that that's really important. And I think representation matters. So it may seem like, you know, it's 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 not that big a deal, right? Just put up whatever you have available. But I think it's the intentionality of of you know, putting up artwork and things that were made by disabled people, uh, I think really sent a strong message 
right? We It also helped us reclaim the space, especially since the space was being used prior. It was important that we really put a disability cultural center feel to it. Um, and it was also supporting local community members, right? Disabled artists, photographers, all of that. And so that was um, a really great way to also, when you're starting out and no one knows you exist, uh, putting out calls for artwork is a great way to call people in, into the space. And then um, one of the other things I think uh, we were very successful at in the beginning and, and uh, likely still are, it, but it, it, pandemic makes this different, is we were very intentional about bringing people into our space to kind of expose them to it. And also, um, you know, obviously there's benefits in, you know, collaborations where you go into their space. But initially when we were starting out, because no one knew about the DCC, a collaborative event held two purposes. One, we want to collaborate and promote intersectionality, but also we want to invite you into our space that didn't exist prior. And um, we exposed other cultural centers to our history um, and to our work and community. Um, and I think that that was really powerful. Um, and I, I would say we got a lot of people that would comment on, on the way our space was designed not just physically uh, for physical accessibility, but aesthetically. Um, and I think it's important because sometimes with, with, within the disability community, it seems like spaces either choose aesthetics and then they lack accessibility or, or, or vice versa. And I feel like we were able to really find that sweet spot. Um, but, you know, I think it was uh, a little easier for us because we already had this great space that we can just make some of those tweaks and kind of turn it into um, our own. But because it was already housed in the Disability Resource Center, of course, it already was accessible in a lot of ways. Um, but we, we um, you know, we took it to the next level. Um, and at the start, we tried to really involve um, the community into into like what they wanted the space to be and what colors and um, listen to, um, you know, that not always a survey of uh, feedback, but responding um, to, to what we're hearing, you know, just organic feedback in the space. Um, yeah, so that's just something that I'll continue, but I also um, just wanna respect that. I know there's other things that you, so this is Margaret speaking. Tony, I know you said you had some thoughts about like, um, you know, staffing and leadership. And I have a couple of ideas about um, how we build a work culture, but do you want to start talking about that? And then I'll just name my ideas and not go into a lot of detail so we can have time for Q&A. Yes, please. And then Margaret, I'm so sorry, but is it possible that you could, um, for some reason, my chat isn't working. Is it possible that you could copy and paste um, where your slides are located again? Sure. Uh, because I'm for so people that joined you. later, yeah. thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm sorry, for some reason, I don't know why it's not allowing me to um, copy and paste. It's allowing me to just select all. Um, Thank you so much, Margaret. Um, so, so in terms of um, the space, right? Because I, I made this point in, in other, other sessions, the space was really important for us. We wanted the space. We wanted to reclaim it. We wanted it to be ours. Um, and so part of reclaiming, you know, reclaiming the space and keeping the space, I think had a lot to do with our real intentionality of, of disabled leadership and bring fr from all facets, whether it's graduate students, um, like I said, I, I was the program coordinator with that, I was the only staff person at the time. Um, and we really tried to hold space uh, for disabled leadership. And I think that that, um, was was wonderful messaging um, and really important because so often it on especially on higher ed in higher ed institutions often disabled people are not holding leadership um, spaces 
So we weren't just doing that because it made sense and it was a cultural center, but we were also sending the message that, you know, we can be leaders across campus. And I think that that was um, really um, intentional. And um, I think I was also, it was really important for me um, to foster that. And since I was a doc student, when I held the position of, of the program coordinator, I was also really on board with keeping that student leadership that's that that strong student because this was a space for the students and of course faculty were involved and and staff were involved but this was like other cultural centers a space for students so i was really um i really wanted to keep um that student leadership um feel in some way um and and that is why um i felt like after i graduated with my phd it felt like a good fit to to move on um because I, I wanted other students to take it on right um and so it was it was wonderful to have that kind of base of leadership um to uh to pass it along to people in my community um which is really great and that might sound kind of cliche like you know hire disabled people like that might sound obvious, but I think on a higher education institution um, in higher ed and in in the you know in society, we know the low number of employment rates for disabled people, and we definitely wanted the space to be a space that challenged that. And so um, we were really intentional. Of course, for any of you that are like uh, non-disabled people, were in the space all the time because we didn't we never policed disability we didn't check that at the door of course we wanted to build uh build allies but we were really careful to also save our space right make sure that it didn't turn into somebody else's space right it was ours and so the way um we did that was through hiring disabled graduate assistants making sure disabled people you know remained in leadership roles um when I, um, I think my second semester, I had an intern, um, uh, and it was the first time we had, like, from the, uh, the, the counseling world, we had an intern at the DCC, um, and ob obviously, um, don't worry, they didn't do any counseling inside the DCC. Um, we really uh, reframed that, and um, yeah, it was super positive to give uh, disabled students that opportunity, even at the internship um, level. So I don't know if there's any um, if, if there's anything else you wanted me to add, Margaret, but um, feel free to take it on. And I will just add a couple of thoughts that I think this is Margaret speaking. I think they kind of connect to what you're saying. Like, yes, totally agree. It it is a hugely important piece of our center that we are an all disabled staff. And I'm not saying, yeah, I mean I we're pretty invested in that, right? Like for the same reasons, like we want the center to be for disabled people, by disabled people. Um, and I think one of the most interesting pieces of this work for me and, um, you know, with my colleagues who I love a lot at the DCC has been just being like, oh, all of these templates we have for being an organization, being a center have, ableism built into them and you know some of the templates are really helpful but like how can we reshape the way we work together and just just how we keep up with tasks and just like the work culture so I just want to share like a guiding principle this is going to probably sound obvious but it's been sometimes um about count like not normal or in a good way to to put into practice just this idea that as a center we are people and a mission not programs and productivity um so this has been kind of about like okay if somebody's having a really bad pain day or whatever it may be we're fine with if we need to we we postpone an event or we cancel it or, you know, or we do what we can to have more than one person covering an event, like sort of facilitating it. Um, 
Right. So when we want to create this situation where people can show up to their access needs, make them known, have them be actually responded to and and not get these messages about well, you should push through because we need to get the work done. Um, and so I think two practices that we do uh, really concretely contribute to what a lot of us have commented on as being an extremely positive work culture, um, one that feels like it, as much as we can figure out how to align with our values from disability culture. Um, and they're about building trust and they're about building transparency. Um, so one of the practices is we have a list of onboarding questions that we, it's a conversation we have with anybody who joins the staff. Um, Usually it starts one on one, but then people are welcome to share like in a staff meeting or like a bigger, a bigger environment. Um, and the, the prompts are in the access copy that I've shared. I'm not going to go into detail, but it's basically like, what do you need to thrive at work? Um, just really inviting people to say that, think about it. Um, what's going to make work miserable for you? What do you need in addition to your access needs? Um, and then the other thing that we do is super nuts and bolts. Um, but we have mostly part-time people. And so like if there's kind of a, a list of things we're all trying to get done together, um, somebody's shift may not work out with like when that needs to get done. So we use this task sheet as a spreadsheet where each person has a tab. It's got like, when does it need to be done by? What's the task? Who's doing it? And then any note. Um, of the progress. So anyway, I, I will not go into detail, but basically that's a way that we make it super clear that either something's flexible, we don't need it to be done at a certain time, do it when you come into work, or this is time sensitive, we do need this to be done at a certain time. Um, and it also facilitates the situation where like if for access reasons, like for disability related reasons, people need to not do the task. If it's just not gonna work out with that week for them, we will reassign it to someone else on staff. Um, or it's a place where everyone else on the staff can check and see, okay, this is in progress or this is done. That was not very clear. So feel free to ask me any clarifying questions. Um, but okay. I will stop there just so we can have a little time together. Yeah. I just wanted to be clear. The reason I just want to uh, reiterate the reason why I said that there was no counseling in the space wasn't because I don't think that disabled people should have access to counseling. We just wanted to protect the space to, to be a place to, you know, celebrate and um, explore disability identity. And of course, um, services are happening outside of the space. But um, I just wanted to clarify that. Um, yeah, I think we had a lot of flexibility and I will say one thing, um, I had to really be okay with at the beginning, right? It's not like everybody's going to show up to events. Um, and I really had to practice this, um, quality over quantity, um, because sometimes, especially in student affairs work, there's this push of like, well, if we don't have like seven events a week or are we doing anything right and and um and so I had to really um be strategic about what what energy I was putting into certain events and um had also to not get demotivated um in the early stages when there were lower numbers um because people didn't know about us you know maybe the event didn't you know hit it out of the ballpark there's a variety of reasons but I think um I think it's really important um, to just hold, like it's uh, the space is an, it can be just as powerful as an event. And I think I had to learn that over time. So I think we would love to open it up for questions. Yeah, um, I, yeah, this is Margaret. I agree wholeheartedly. Let me actually open the chat. And then we did get a question that came in um, more directly. So I'm going to go ahead and just read that one out. Um, okay. So someone asked, what kind of modifications have you made 
for online students who are off campus to better engage with courses, other students, clubs, and in general. So remote access, um, I can speak a little bit to that. I know Tony, you were not working in a cultural center during the pandemic, um, but I mean, I, I would love to hear what you think too, but um, I will say that even we're, we're a little bit proud of this. I will brag about it. We did have remote access before the pandemic and it was a pretty different form because Zoom was not really a thing before the pandemic for us. We were inviting people to call in to our discussion on Skype if they wanted to. Um, but I think in terms of the, the more general question, uh, we're still totally virtual. We have not really done events on campus yet. We're hoping to figure that out for the fall. Um, we do have our lounge open. So like Tony was just saying, like having a space to be in and of itself can be really powerful. So that's kind of our strategy right now. Um, but yeah, I don't know, Tony, if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I don't, I, I, I know what worked as an instructor, um, but I don't feel that I speak to, um, you know, what it was like during a, you know, to be a part of a cultural center during the pandemic and with virtual things. I don't feel that that's outside of my scope, um, but I'm sure um, there's a lot of parallels there. Um, we have a question in the chat from UC Access Now, which is such a good question. It's such an Love interesting this question. question. So um, they're saying, I, I arrived late, so pardon me if this has been addressed. Um, but how do you address conflicting access needs in the design of your spaces and events? Um, and I, just in case you weren't here yet, one thing I touched on is that we have lamps in our lounge in order to not use fluorescent light, but the lamps we had were too dim. Um, that was an, one example that's coming to mind immediately about conflicting access needs. Um, just, yeah, so the, yeah, and the way we solved that is to try to get it so that it was adjustable, but could be adjusted to the same brightness as the fluorescent light would provide. Um, but that's a different question from what you're really asking, I think. Um, and our strategy in the lounge was to, I think we could work on this. We would sort of, we had a little sign, it was part of the spiel when we would welcome people to like feel free to adjust the space. Um, but if there's other people in here, you could let them know what you're planning to do and check in. Um, we just try to invite people to start a conversation about it and hopefully work out a mutually agreeable situation. Um, mm -hmm. but Tony, what do you think? Do you have any? Yeah, so I, I love this question, not just for um, you know DCCs, but I think that this is always something we think about um, when we're thinking about accessible um, you know, accessible spaces, accessible events. I think um, I, I will say, I, I think in terms of um, at least early on for events, right? Um, because some of it is like, you don't know what you don't know in terms of like, you don't know what things are gonna conflict. So I think a big part of helping to address at least the response if there is a conflicting need is transparency about what is happening about at the event. Um, and I, I think that, and this is just as a disabled person, I think that a, a lot of events, and this has nothing to do with, this is just a personal anecdote about like, just existing in society as a disabled person. A lot of things that talk about access, like if I go to somebody's website, it'll just say like, it's accessible, but they don't address like the user experience or what about it is accessible or if there's inaccessible areas, like what am I missing? Like if I go to this museum and the best artwork is inaccessible, I might not choose to go there, but I think it's about being transparent. So I think um, we tried to be um, very transparent about what was happening in the event so uh, people could make you know the most informed choices. Um, you know, of course, we didn't get it right 100% of the time, but I think what made it okay was the way we responded. Um, and and I, I think if a lot of people focused on their response um, and how to validate and access frustration or a conflicting need, that would really um, 
you know, I think the harm is reduced in a lot of ways. I mean, I know when I talk in community uh, with other disabled people, disabled people say all the time that they would rather go somewhere that's physically inaccessible but attitudinally accessible than vice versa. And of course, we want 100% access, right? But I think the attitudes to me is, is the way we respond to those needs. Um, I will say in the space, um, we had a, the space isn't huge, but to, like if it wasn't very busy, two people could be very much at one end of the space and, and other people at the other end. And, you know, there was enough space to kind of do your own thing. I don't know if you missed this, but I also think one way to kind of address conflicting needs is having options of how people could participate and how people can engage in the space or at the event. Um, Okay, so another, this is Margaret. This addresses individuals communicating their needs, but how did you design flexibility and modularity in the infrastructure, mm -hmm. furniture, et cetera? Yeah. Option. Yeah, so we talked a little bit about this earlier on, but uh, we had, um, like, all the furniture was on wheels. All was easily movable. We had different seating options um, within the space, uh, different um, types of seating. Uh, different types of tables, tables that could adjust, different types of of materials in the space. Um, we didn't have like a, a separate quiet uh, area with a door, but at one point, and again, this is early on and spaces are fluid, but earlier on we had a um, like an area that was designated as, as that space. Um, yeah, so... Um, yeah, but I think like earlier on, we really had to be adaptable because I would say we didn't know what we didn't know. Um, also from observations, like not just people communicating their needs, but uh, like observing how people are using the space helped us make decisions about maybe for this type of event, we need less chairs or we need to, you know, we need to have this event that's a DCC event, but outside of the space you know, depending on what it um, was. Um. Yeah, um, I will just add something really quickly and then we can see if we have time for another question. Um, I just wanna underline everything that Tony's saying. Uh, the thing that gets me going is thinking about accessibility from a disability culture perspective. And one thing that I have been thinking about a lot lately is why it bothers me when there's a checklist approach to accessibility. And I think it's because it gets rid of that relationality piece that Tony was mentioning, the access information, a way to contact somebody, permission to have the conversation at all. I think those are just like so important. Um, and I, in terms of some of the other things that you brought up, we do have some pretty significant limitations in terms of budget to buy different furniture and just the space that we are provided. So um, I think what you're thinking about in terms of different areas would be so amazing. And um, right now we don't have um, the infrastructure for that, but yeah. I think Margaret, we have time to take this one from Emily. Um, I am in the very early stages of planning DCC and advocating to get one at my university. What kinds of programming and services do you guys offer at your DCCs? I mean, I can speak to what we offered very early on in 2018 to 2019. Um, I'm sure we've grown and I'm sure, um, but um, we did... We did a lot of joint events with other people because at the beginning, we didn't have a lot of infrastructure. Um, so we partnered with the local Center for Independent Living, um, other, other partners. I think in the beginning, it was my goal to have at least one event uh, uh, that promoted like the intersectionality of experiences. And um, so with other cultural centers on campus, and that helped us with budgeting and support. Um, so that was kind of really cool. So we did, you know, a, a couple of joint events. Um, 
I know I remember we hosted like a talk with the LGBTQI plus resource center and it was like ableism in the, you know, the LGBTQI plus community. And it was just like a hosted discussion. Um, another thing I, I joke around, but in student affairs, you got to have food and a variety of food options um, if you want, you know, uh, another way to draw in people. Um, but I'm sure programming looks a lot different virtually. I think when I was doing it, um, it was very much about getting people in the space because we wanted people to know that we existed. Um, yeah, this is Margaret. Similarly, um, and actually that's the next, um, the next session is going to be kind of about programs. So there'll be kind of a sampling of possible programs that people are going to talk about. But I did link in the chat the DCC program series. And like Tony said, we also really love to collaborate with our sibling centers, um, the other cultural centers. We do sometimes have like one-off events where we'll have a lecture from somebody. Um, And this is Margaret, a strategic thought from UC Access Now that I want to share out. In some ways, having a temporary DCC space makes sense because you can learn from trial without spending your own building budget on designing the space. If and when you eventually have your own purpose-built space, you can design in an informed, experienced way for flexibility. Y yes, I appreciate that very. Uh, um thought and I agree that it helps you you know plan and be strategic for the future but as like uh, I would say it's very difficult in in the student affairs world to be temp in anything uh, temp in space temp in staff um, because you have to you're dealing with this um, idea of like well we can't make this move because it's a temporary space we can't do this because so I think sometimes it can serve as a barrier it can serve as a way to do a trial and error um, uh, but I think um, you know if you don't have that much infrastructure it's then hard to to you know move every couple of years or um, yeah yeah, I would, this is Margaret, I would echo that. And um, so I think getting to as permanent a space as you can um, is good. And I'm also gonna say something kind of cynical, which is that unfortunately at this point in history, it's uncommon, but not, it does happen. I think UC Berkeley got like a beautiful budget to renovate a space that would really work. Like they're making it up, they're designing it fully. Um, but I think it's much more common to get a space that has certain things, certain aspects that you did not choose and then making it, making it work to the fullest extent that you can. With that said, I think what you're sharing is a really helpful perspective on if you are in the situation of having a temporary space, like how can you use it as a laboratory? Um, so yeah, I think that time, I wanna thank everyone. Thank you, Tony, for being such thank a- Thank you so much. Um, conversationalist as ever and very helpful, thoughtful. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone. We'll see you in, um, we have a half hour break before the next session if you'll be joining us. And that will be back in that main Zoom. It'll be a program focused session, um, just sharing out some programs that DCCs have tried, things that have worked and things that were learning curves.